Welcome to part 9 of our series, Secrets of Glessner House. Today, we are going to look at the history of electricity in the house and the few remnants of that early system that can still be seen today. The history of electric lighting, of course, starts with Thomas Edison, who developed the first viable light bulb in October 1879. In late 1880, he established the Edison Illuminating Company a utility that would provide the necessary electric service. Not surprisingly, electricity was at first available only to the wealthy. In 1882, banker J.P. Morgan became one of the first men to have electricity installed in his house. Here we see Morgan's New York City mansion on Madison Avenue and 39th Street. In a bit of irony, one of the first electrical fires also took place in this house destroying Morgan's personal library. The Western Electric Light Company, the forerunner to Commonwealth Edison, was incorporated in Chicago in May of 1882. One of the first stockholders was John Wesley Doan, a successful wholesale grocer. That same year, Doan built his new home at 1827 South Prairie Avenue, where he installed an electric plant in the basement of his coach house. The cost of the plant and related wiring was $8,000, an astronomical sum for the time. On November 10, 1882, the Doans celebrated their 25th wedding anniversary and officially opened their new home to 400 friends. A newspaper account noted, quote, The interior of the house is as exquisitely rich as taste and art can make it. Mr. Doan has illuminated his house with 250 of the Edison electric incandescent light bulbs, and they made the house brilliant in the extreme." Unquote. Within months, several of Doan's Prairie Avenue neighbors utilized his electric plant to provide power to their own homes. In 1887, Robert Todd Lincoln, John Wesley Doan, and several other Prairie Avenue residents organized the Chicago Edison Company which secured the exclusive rights to provide electrical service to a large swath of the city, extending from North Avenue south to 39th Street. The Glessner House, being completed that year, was wired for electricity in anticipation of this new service, although gas lighting was used initially. In early 1890, Chicago Edison began advertising for customers in the Prairie Avenue neighborhood as the company was completing its new power plant on Wabash Avenue near 27th Street. John Glessner expressed interest, noting that his house was already wired for electricity. Prior to the completion of the electric service at Glessner House, systems including the burglar alarm, servant's call system, doorbells, and the gas light ignition system operated with low voltage wiring, as seen here all of which was powered by wet cell batteries. Glessner House was completely rewired for direct current electricity in the summer of 1892. It is not entirely clear why the house had to be rewired, but it was most likely due to the quickly advancing technology during the five years since the house had been constructed. In areas such as the basement, shown at left, where the wiring did not need to be concealed, it was placed in wood conduit that was screwed onto the walls. In other locations, as seen on the right, the wires were merely held in place with a wood cleat. The wire was made of copper and would have been wrapped in cloth insulation. There were two channels in the wood conduit to accommodate the wires. A cap was nailed on top to provide easy access if the wire needed servicing. Although this wood conduit was not visible in any of the finished rooms of the house, in many other houses it would have been seen. Therefore, the conduit was designed to blend in with other wood moldings. Another common method of installing the electric wiring was to simply run it through the now abandoned gas pipes. This does not appear to have been done in Glessner House, as seen in this image of the corner guest room, where the wires would have followed the path of the gas piping but were located outside of the pipe. 
The installation of the new wiring created a great deal of disruption in the house, as many of the walls had to be opened up, resulting in all rooms being repainted and repapered after the wiring installation was complete. One positive outcome was that the Glessners hired English decorator William Prettyman at that time to create and install a new hand-painted burlap wall covering in the parlor. This view of a push-button light switch mounted to the side of a bookcase in the library provides a rare glimpse of how the wiring came into the rooms. In the left photo, looking inside the bookcase, you will see the wood conduit covering the wires coming out of the wall. A large, round wood cover conceals the opening where the wires were connected to the light switch, seen in the photo at right. The process of installation was long and difficult, John Glessner noting in a letter to his wife, quote, The electric fixture men have done better today, but by no means well, though I believe tomorrow will get them out of places where I don't want them to be, unquote. Many of the gas fixtures were converted to electricity, but in other places, such as servant areas, they were simply replaced with new electric fixtures. The installation of electricity posed some risk, and a serious accident took place when a workman carelessly left one of the gas pipes open. A maid, Maggie Charles, alerted John Glessner of the smell of gas in the second floor hallway, and when they went to investigate, there was a gas explosion, strong enough to blow the plate glass out of the adjacent windows, dislodge several roof beams, and set the linen closet on fire. John Glessner was burned slightly, but Maggie more severely, and she required weeks of medical care. The photo at left shows a surviving original electrical outlet, which is mounted to the top of the partner's desk in the library. An original plug, which still works, is shown at right. There were competing electrical systems at the time, so when you would buy something like a table lamp, it would be purchased without the plug. You would then attach the appropriate plug to work with the system installed in your home. The electric meter would have been mounted to the wall in the first floor servant's hallway, inside the tradesman's door. The wood conduits seen near the center of this photo, extending about four feet above the floor, shows the location of the meter. Here we see a close-up showing the top of the wood conduit and the holes in the glazed brick wall where the meter was mounted. The electric meter would have looked very similar to the vintage example shown at right, part of the collection of the main historical society. There is evidence that the electrical system was updated through the years. Here we see one of the few surviving examples of knob and tube wiring in the house, located in the attic over the servants' bedrooms. This system, which became common after 1900, eliminated the inherent risk of using combustible wood for conduit and cleats, and instead used porcelain knobs to secure the wires. The knob was screwed into place, and the wire was twisted around it to hold it secure. A major change to the electrical system took place in 1941, during the period in which the house was owned by the Armour Institute. It was at this time that the service was converted from direct current to the much more common alternating current. The reason for the change was probably due to the desire to install fluorescent lighting in several of the rooms, which required alternating current. This safety switch box would have been installed at that time and can still be seen mounted to the wall in the basement. The house has been largely rewired since the 1960s and all of the missing light fixtures have been replicated. We are fortunate to have several small surviving pieces of the electrical system to provide clues as to how this technology was installed during its infancy in the late 19th century. This concludes our look at early electricity, and we hope you have enjoyed learning more about our latest secret of Glessner House. Tune in next time when another secret will be revealed.